Hi, I'm creating this vlog to evoke a deeper sense of understanding towards Shakespeare's iconic tragedy, Hamlet. Now, to establish some context before diving in, I'll introduce some more relevant characters. Starting off, we have Hamlet, the protagonist and prince of Denmark. Then we have Claudius, who's the antagonist, Hamlet's uncle, and the new king of Denmark. Next, Gertrude, Hamlet's mother and the queen of Denmark. Then, Polonius, the father of Laertes and Ophelia. And Ophelia is Hamlet's love interest and Polonius' daughter. There's also Horatio, who is a loyal friend of Hamlet. And finally, Fortinbras, who's a prince of Norway and Denmark's enemy Take nation. too long to read aloud the entire play. To dive deeper into the context of this vlog, here's a somewhat detailed summary instead. This play is a tragedy encompassing Hamlet's desire to avenge his father's death. Hamlet is a young prince of Denmark whose father was wrongfully murdered at the hands of his uncle. He becomes incredibly spiteful, which drives him to madness. The story starts off acknowledging the death of Hamlet's father, the old king of Denmark, which coerces Hamlet's mother, Gertrude, to marry the new king, Claudius, Hamlet's uncle. Hamlet goes to see the ghost of his father. The ghost tells Hamlet that Claudius was the one who murdered him. At the same time, Ophelia tells her father, Polonius, who works for Claudius, that Hamlet has not been acting himself. Polonius thinks it's because Ophelia has not been attentive enough. However, when Hamlet rejects Ophelia's attention, they quickly learn that something else is going on. Polonius relays this message to Claudius, so he sends Hamlet's friends from school, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, to spy on Hamlet. Hamlet discovers they're working for his uncle relatively quickly. They tell Hamlet they've invited actors to perform a play at the court. At the same time, Claudius discovers they have an enemy to be wary of. Fortinbras, the prince of Norway, is closing in on them. When the play transitions to the performance that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern promised Hamlet, Hamlet uses this as an opportunity to prove his uncle's guilt. So he has the actors act out the death of his father while simultaneously observing his uncle's reaction. Surely enough, his uncle storms out. While on his way to convince his mother of his uncle's guilt, he overhears his uncle praying in the church. He comes close to killing him, but realizes that his uncle is inside the church and in the process of begging God for forgiveness, so he'd go straight to heaven if he was murdered. He desperately tries to convince his mom of his uncle's guilt while Polonius is behind a curtain eavesdropping. In Hamlet's urgency, Gertrude misunderstands him and thinks he's going to kill her, so she screams for help. This caused Polonius to scream as well. Thinking it was his uncle, Hamlet stabs through the curtain and accidentally kills Polonius. In response to Hamlet murdering Polonius, Claudius sends Rosencrantz to Guildenstern with a letter on a diplomatic mission to England with Hamlet. This letter tells the king of England to have Hamlet killed. Hamlet discovers this letter and replaces it with a letter instructing the king to have his friends killed instead. Polonius' son, Laertes, is infuriated by his father's murder and threatens to dethrone Claudius. In response, Claudius informs Laertes that Hamlet's guilty, so they form an alliance and conclude that Laertes, being a talented sword fighter, will challenge Hamlet to a duel. To further reassure that Hamlet will die, they plan to line Laertes' sword with poison and offer Hamlet a cup filled with poison as well. While on his way home, Hamlet passes through a graveyard with a funeral procession. When a funeral procession commences and Laertes informs Hamlet that the grave was dug for his sister and also Hamlet's true love, Ophelia. Essentially, Ophelia killed herself because Polonius and Laertes told her that Hamlet did not really love her and forbade her from seeing him, which was not true. Then Hamlet is back at the court and discovers Laertes' plan to duel him in a sword fight. Hamlet agrees to duel him. Shortly after the sword fight begins, Hamlet is doing so well that his mother Gertrude toasts to his skills and enthusiasm. However, the cup she was holding was a cup Claudius filled with poison. Before he could stop her, she drank it. Laertes, acknowledging their plan had been revealed, decides to slash Hamlet. However, during the fight, their swords were switched, enabling Laertes to fall victim to the poisoned sword. At this point, Gertrude is dead. Both Hamlet and Laertes are dying. So Laertes decides he's, he may as well tell Hamlet about his uncle's plan. So Hamlet stabs his uncle, killing him. 
with everyone dead, Fortin Braz can finally step in and proclaim his role as Denmark's now, new king. evidently enough, death is ubiquitous throughout this play. There's nonstop conflict and consequences engulfing Hamlet entirely. Is constant death and destruction supposed to evoke the audience's empathy towards Hamlet, or is it supposed to have us question him? Allow me to introduce an academic journal I provide here in the landscape of death, crossing the boundaries of life and the afterlife by Sharon Emmerichs. Essentially, she acknowledges deathscapes, which are places for the dead, and how Shakespeare's characters succumb to both a bodily death and a spiritual one. She supports an unorthodox perspective in which Hamlet is actually a Protestant play as opposed to a Catholic one. This is because it demonstrates the harsh consequences inflicted upon Hamlet while he followed Catholic tenets. Hamlet treating spaces of the dead, how Catholics would view them, results in him I'm going suffering. to further analyze a specific portion of her journal that reflects back to Ophelia being buried at the graveyard. She says, by burying Ophelia in the consecrated grave, the priest recognizes the transgression, which is an unlawful act of these oppositional meanings of space. His attitude is perfectly in keeping with the predominant Protestant early modern belief in which social categorizations of the living informed attitudes to the dead. Perhaps, particularly when the categorization was itself involved with the cause of death, as with heretics and excommunicates, criminals, and suicides, which happens to be how Ophelia died. She then goes on to say, the actual burial rites themselves serve to complete the separation of the dead from the living as well as usher the soul of the dead from this world onto the next. Shakespeare, however, purposely interrupts the separation of the living and the dead through the misuse of his deathscapes in order to emphasize the tragic, faulty nature of his protagonist, as well as the immutable character of the deathscapes themselves. Hamlet and Ophelia both experience change through their interactions with the deathscapes, whereas the landscape itself does not. So, the subject analyzed is not the debate of whether or not misuse of the deathscape itself was demonstrated in Hamlet, but the debate of what it's supposed to communicate, the underlying message behind the consequence. We can define a relation between misusing deathscapes and the consequences that follow. You'd have to purposely search for it, you'd have to desire to look further. Her statements regarding Hamlet's disregard for deathscapes and the multiple deaths that follow encapsulates the idea that Hamlet's story isn't that tragic after 